Well, I hope I'm not flying under false colors because uh, the, uh, I, I wrote an article on uh, uh, Hegel on teleology many, many years ago. Actually, the first draft, I think, was in 1982. Um, and I really haven't changed my mind much uh, or really much at all uh, about it. So I'm going to uh, basically resume for you the, uh, uh, the article that uh, I think ended up getting published in 91. Uh, and uh, you know, try to do that hopefully efficiently uh, so that we'll have uh, more time for discussion. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe you'll point me to the error of my ways, but I, I still think that my uh, reading of uh, Hegel and teleology is a, is, a, is a pretty sound one. I think actually uh, quite illuminating. So uh, the nutshell uh, version of uh, my uh, reading of Hegel uh, is that we can find in him arguments, first, that teleological judgments uh, can be and should be thought to be, um, not always, but uh, can be at least, uh, under the right conditions, as objective as any other kind of judgment, and in particular, any kind of judgment that we make uh, in the sciences, um, even using his expansive notion of science. And secondly, um, the uh, often common model of uh, teleology, which I call the intentional model, we can also think of it as sort of the externally imposed model in the sense that uh, uh, intention, um, ends, goals are something, if an object has it, it's something that we have imposed upon it. Goals always originate in our minds. But that kind of intentional teleology, in fact, uh, presupposes, and in order to be made sense of, really requires a non-intentional, uh, internal, uh, or what you call natural, I think it was actually a more Aristotelian, form of teleology, so that the uh, intentional model of teleology is based upon that more natural Aristotelian teleology, uh, and that we have to think of the, tele the Aristotelian natural teleology that is internal to objects themselves as more fundamental. All right, so that's the, uh, uh, the basic uh, thrust and now let me try and put some uh, meat on those bones. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna approach the, con the uh, uh, concept of objectivity first. Uh, and I think that there are, uh, well, there are two questions. One is what is the, in particular, the epistemic status of teleological judgments? Are they merely subjective judgments? Like, you know, liver tastes good. Um, that's pretty subjective. Some people like liver, some people don't, who cares? subjective, um, or are they objective? Like for instance, uh, you know, my desk is made of oak or uh, I am taller than a, a stool or something like that. Uh, so that's one question. The second question is, well, okay, but what is the proper analysis of teleological judgment? That is what's really going on when we uh, make a teleological uh, judgment? What, what are we really in fact committed to in our assertions? Um, and in my opinion, um, and I think this holds true for both uh, Kant and for Hegel and for, for, for most of uh, the uh, philosophers since, uh, the answer to these questions really depends on what we make out of teleological explanations. Tele teleological judgments are sort of the, the focal point, um, but they, they make sense um, because they contribute to teleological explanations, and it's the usefulness, the status and viability of teleological explanations that's really uh, at stake, and in particular, um, their role in science, however narrowly or broadly you construe the notion of uh, science. Um, now, pretty clearly, uh, up until the rise of the new sciences and so-called modern philosophy, um, teleological judgments were thought to be fairly unproblematic. I mean, for Aristotle, they're uh, one of the four causes, uh, or they 
they describe one of the four causes and they're absolutely, you know, uh, built into the nature of the world. Uh, but with the rise of the new sciences, teleological judgments got really uh, placed into a bad light. They, you know, sort of found that a number of them are in fact uh, ridiculous things like uh, we have noses in order to support our eyeglasses, or you know we have ears in order to support our earrings. Uh, no, no, that that's not true. Um, so you find people like Spinoza, uh, for instance, thoroughly and and explicitly rejecting all forms of teleological explanation. Okay, Kant. You know, Leibniz, as it were, still held on. He still thought that teleological explanations were uh, legitimate in their place. Um, we can worry about what that place is. Uh, so Kant picked up that issue, revived it, uh, but he did so in a new light, I think. Uh, he held that there are no objectively justifiable attributions of purposiveness in a world that the structure of which is fixed by his list of categories, that is in the phenomenal world. He couldn't claim anything about the world of the in itself, whether that was teleological or not, who knows? Maybe someone cares, but you don't know. Um, and so here's a nice quote from the uh, uh, critique of judgment uh, that makes that point. Um, and of course, one of the points of the critique of pure reason is that we can never be forced to seek a causality outside natural laws. We are limited in what we can know to what is tied to natural laws. So according to Kant, uh, purposive judgments, attributions of design to nature are in fact merely heuristic, they're provisional, and ultimately they would need to be discarded in favor of mechanistic explanations uh, which tell us how the objective world, the phenomenal world, is actually constituted. Kant also held that, in fact, some attributions of design uh, are never finally going to be able to be cashed out in mechanical terms, uh, and those phenomena will remain forever, as it were, beyond our scientific ken. Um, and that uh, applies in particular to two major uh, categories of things. One is the world whole itself uh, and the other organisms. Uh, he says an organism, uh, an organized being is then not a mere machine for that has merely motive power, but it possesses in itself formative power of a self-propagating kind. Uh, but that's something that he thought we'd never actually be able to uh, get a mechanical explanation of. So Although we have to believe that we live in a world that is populated by organisms and we are ourselves organisms, uh, in fact, according to Kant, we can never really know that to be the case uh, because for him, the concept of an organism is actually not a scientific and objective uh, concept. It is something that we use, it is heuristic and, and we couldn't do without it, but eh, that's just a practical affair. Um, and I think Hegel objects to that very uh, strenuously. Here's a quote from uh, the Encyclopedia, uh, paragraph 58. Even according to Kant's own exposition, there would have been an obligation to admit, in the case of natural productions, a knowledge not confined to the categories of quality, cause and effect, composition, constituents, and so on. The principle of inward adaptation or design had it been kept to and carried out in a scientific application, would have led to a different and higher method of observing nature. Uh, and I take it that means we're not going to, you know, transcend science altogether. It, this different and higher method of observing nature, in fact, will be a more thoroughly scientific uh, method of engaging with nature. So he thinks that uh, the uh, teleological judgments that are made, for instance, by biologists um, are, you know, perfectly fine. They, 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 they have as much right to be considered objective and can be as well supported with evidence um, as any of the judgments made by a physicist. Uh, Kant, uh, Hegel also thought that Kant's position ultimately makes it impossible for knowledge to be fully self-reflective for us as it were, or for knowledge to know what knowledge is, uh, because he thinks that intentional phenomena uh, 
all have underlying um, purposiveness. Uh, so if you can't make uh, ultimate sense out of purposiveness, you're not going to be able to make ultimate sense out of thought itself. So uh, whereas Kant thought that uh, mechanical and purposive explanation were mutually exclusive, uh, Hegel just doesn't agree with that. He thinks that not only is there no conflict between them, but he actually thinks that teleological explanation presupposes mechanical explanation. Mechanism comes before uh, chemism and, and teleology in, in the logic uh, because mechanism is actually presupposed by uh, uh, teleological explanations. Uh, so in his view, the end and end is that for which a chain of mechanical causes work. Me mechanisms are the means by which ends are achieved. So he doesn't think that these uh, explanatory uh, structures, as it were, necessarily conflict at all. All right, so now we move on to the analysis of teleology. Uh, and here, are, uh, I'm gonna depart a little bit more from Hegel's text because I think we need to uh, think in sort of broader terms to see what's going on because of course the text is uh, Hegelian, so it's always hard to interpret. So first I'm gonna introduce what I call the intentional model of teleology. And that is that when we say that, um, just take as a sort of a standardization of our descriptions of teleology, S did A in order to G, um, we are attributing to the subject S uh, a complex intentional state. Uh, and it's complex in that it involves both beliefs and desires, that is, it has a cognitive aspect and a conative aspect, um, which combine to be causally sufficient for A's do, for S's doing A, or at least you know, starting to do or attempting to do A. Um, the telos, the goal, enters only in the content of those intentional states, uh, so that there is no commitment to its existence nor to its possessing a backwards causal efficacy. So um, the telos, you know, because after all, telos's goals are not always achieved. Um, somehow the goal is involved in the production of uh, an activity, um, but it can't do so if it's not itself already real in some sense. But according to the intentional model, it's quote, reality is what Descartes would have called an objective reality. That is, it exists as the content uh, of a mental act. Um, this model of intentionality, you know, works pretty well, uh, and it can be expanded to include artifactual proposiveness for the purposes of uh, artifacts are, you know, placed upon them, attributed to them, bestowed upon them by us, right? Red lights mean stop, well, because we made them mean stop. We've decided that's the way uh, traffic uh, is to be regulated in our society. So no problem there. Um, but this model of intentionality runs into troubles when we get into non-intentional organisms and organs. We do want to say things like the heart beats in order to circulate blood. It seems to be just plain true. Uh, trees grow to capture sunlight. That explains why they grow the way they do, you know, things like that. Uh, but we don't think that the heart itself has any uh, intentional states. Um, at least I certainly don't think so. And I don't think that trees um, are sort of standing there conniving ways to get more sunlight uh, by trying to concoct plans or something like that. That's not what goes on there. So the intentional model has its limits. Um, and notice Kant thought that the intentional model is the model of teleology. Kant really thought that that's how teleology uh, itself works. Um, and I claim that Hegel's discussion of the subjective end in uh, his two logics is an examination of precisely this model of teleology. He identifies both, both cognitive and conative elements in it that together work to realize the goal. Uh, but uh, he argues uh, subjective ends, so far as they exist in our mental acts, 
are individualized, they're multiple, there are all kinds of them, they're arbitrary, they're thoroughly contingent. So he thinks that this really can't be a fundamental form of explanation, an explanatory stopping point, as it were, because it necessarily leaves uh, unanswered a number of questions. Where do the goals come from? Why is that the goal? What's, you know, the other things like that. In particular, we're left with the question, how is the gap, the inevitable gap between the subjective end, uh, the beliefs and desires of the intentional subject and objective reality itself to be bridged? That is how does uh, what's going on in the mind end up actually being effective in the world? Um, and Hegel calls this the question of the means. Um, now, a little bit of a, not quite a side note, it's really an essential note. We have to recognize in order to really understand to get hold of what, what's going on uh, with Hegel's discussion, that Hegel does believe that it is one of the peculiarities of teleology is that really, uh, as it were, in full-fledged teleology, um, the final cause, the goal, is productive of itself. He thinks of teleology as fundamentally always uh, being couched in a context where self-realization is the fundamental um, uh, structure going on. Um, so the idea that teleology is uh, fundamentally uh, self-realization, uh, for one thing, distinguishes it from mechanical causation, because in, in mechanical causation, one event has to be, uh, you know, as Hume taught us, logically distinguishable from the event it causes, from its effect, um, and it's not realizing itself, it is causing something distinct and external from it uh, to be the case. Um, so in that sense for Hegel, uh, teleological explanations as uh, statements about the self-realization of something uh, reveal the internal, the ontological structure of the object in a way that no mechanical explanation really could. Mechanical explanations may uh, focus on a particular aspect, maybe the mass or the momentum of something, but they don't really get at the fundamental nature of the object itself necessarily. Um, I think teleological explanations really do give you a better picture of what the object itself really is. He says the uh, subjective end minimizes the difference between mechanical and teleological explanation by assimilating te teleology as closely as possible uh, to mechanical causation. That is this, this, this intentional model makes it look like teleology is just a special case of mechanical causation. The subjective uh, mental state causes the external um, real world uh, event or object. Uh, and it differs from standard uh, mechanical causation only in that the cause is confined to a special inner subjective realm rather than itself being you know another physical item in the physical universe um, and uh, he thinks that if we look closely at the means that unifies the subjective end and its realization uh, we come to see a more fundamental form of teleology at work so let's look more closely at what he says about the means. Uh, he says, uh, as I've noted, two shortcomings uh, that uh, beset the subjective end model. Uh, one is the purposiveness of the world. Uh, and he thinks that um, to impose the subjective end or the intentional model of teleology on the notion of the world as a goal as itself a self-realizing entity um, gets us into a big problem because it presupposes an extra mundane God. That is a God that would be somehow outside the world that makes the world, you know, intends the world to be what it is, to develop in a certain way. Um, but 
then you've got this external God and he thinks that that ultimately ends up being uh, a conceptually incoherent notion because an extra mundane God would have to be a finite God because it has something over against it that is not it and therefore it has a limit, it's a bound, it's finite, a finite God is not a God at all. So that's all incoherent. The other problem with the intentional model, again, as I noted, is the proposiveness uh, of organisms. Um, and we could ask here, well, okay, if the intentional model uh, has difficulty dealing with the proposiveness of uh, organisms, why not infer that, for instance, in the case of artifacts, generally, the intentional model uh, presupposes an extra mundane intelligence, the effect of which on the world. Well, the idea is that you, you, know, you think of um, you know, all the uh, organisms in the world as being, well, the artifacts of God, as a lot of people do, right? And, artifact, and, and, and organisms have uh, the teleology they do because God designed them to be that way. But once again, uh, he thinks you end up with an extra mundane God and, and you end up not really understanding uh, the nature of an organism. Organisms are not mere artifacts. Uh, and God is, you know, his, his hand, as it were, is not uh, evident in them in the same way that uh, the hand of the cobbler is evident in the shoe. Shoes don't build themselves. Shoes don't uh, self-realize. Uh, in the way that, for instance, trees and squirrels do. Squirrels, you know, they develop, they grow, they become themselves. Uh, the acorn becomes an oak. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, God's not in there doing it for the oak, it's doing it itself. So that's the problem faced uh, in the section of uh, the teleology chapter called the means. Um, and then Hegel, in his uh, inimitable fashion, uses the syllogism, which he uses often as a model, uh, but he uses it as the model for the relationships he's trying uh, to analyze. And he says the means uh, uh, must be both in the causal order and yet also be immediately subject to the intention. If you're going to make, you know, use the intentional model and have it uh, make sense, then Ultimately, you have to find something, what he calls the means, that is, as it were, Janus faced. It's got, as it were, one face solidly or one foot solidly in the intentional realm and one foot solidly enough in the causal physical order to be able to effectuate things. Um, so, how do you get out of that? Because how do you find something that has both those aspects? If you're a good Cartesian, of course. You can't. There is nothing that is uh, both uh, subjective and uh, physical at the same time, uh, or subjective and uh, material uh, or extended. And he says, well, um, we need to think about it in a different way. Namely, if we think of the subjective end no longer as an external cause of the action as being in that way external, uh, to the action, but rather as embodied in the action, as in, inhabiting and informing the, the, the activity, the, the movement, the behavior, whatever you want to say, um, the relation between the objective event or mo movement and the subjective end or intention is, I think he would say, a form of identity. Uh, expression he thinks of as an, uh, uh, a relation of identity in, in, in in some way. Um, so he argues that there have to be certain special objects in the world without which the intentional model of teleology could not have application. Um, and these special objects are namely organisms where uh, they are, where, where the organism's external behavior is an expression of its internal uh, state of its internal uh, arrangements, as it were, uh, subjective arrangements. And uh, notice this is thoroughly consistent with his general critique of, of Cartesianism, uh, because the Cartesian tradition uh, cannot deal with the uh, objective existence of organisms. Descartes you know, says explicitly that 
uh, animals are just machines, our body's just a machine. Um, and yet he argues the concept of an intention, which is absolutely essential to any you know, respectable notion of mind, uh, actually, he says, presupposes that of an animated body, of an organism, not just a machine. Uh, for only in such beings is the object of reality rich enough to support and be supported by a subjectivity dwelling within it. All right, so what's the alternative? Let's look at the uh, alternative model. Um, and here I'm going to call it a functional teleology, which hooks up with um, uh, more modern discussions. Uh, and here, if we say that S does A in order to G, where we're talking about, uh, for instance, hearts beating in order to pump blood, um, it turns out to be the case that we're usually not talking about specific uh, instances or specific cases of, for instance, my heart just had that beat in order to uh, circulate the blood. This is something that, 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 that hearts, they are the kind of thing that typically and generically uh, do things like beat um, and that this reliably enough contributes to achieving things of the kind G to enable S to realize itself, to realize its concept. Um, and in such a functional uh, description or, or attribution of functional teleology, of course, there's no need be, no attribution of an intentional state uh, to anything. Um, you know, hearts don't have intentional states, but they do beat in order to pump, uh, circulate blood. So the explanatory power of a functional explanation arises not from the ill understood causal efficacy of inner subjective states, but rather from an orchestration of individually normal interactions that produce some ultimate goal, or at least tend to produce some ultimate goal. They, they may fail. At some point, my heart will give out. Um, his insistence that the ultimate goal of any teleological activity is a form of self-realization then puts teleology really at the very heart of metaphysics, for it amounts really, I think, to an assertion that things being what they are is itself ultimately a teleological affair. Uh, you know, not just the world whole, but your being what you are is a teleological affair. You're trying to achieve yourself. He thinks of, you know, virtually everything in the world as striving in some way or other to achieve its own uh, concept, to achieve itself. And, you know, with varying success, uh, he does think that nature is imperfect. Most things don't achieve themselves with any kind of perfection, but what should we say? They get close enough uh, to make themselves real. Um, and some of us get to be more perfect human beings than others, we'll see. Um, so again, to make sense out of this, uh, I think we do have to spend a little time to talk about his rather special understanding of the notion of a concept. Uh, he does, you know, pick up themes from Kant here. Concepts are unifiers. They unify thoughts subjectively and they unify things objectively. And the model here is Kant's transcendental unity of my perception. A merely material thing is in fact self-external. That is no appeal to the concept of the thing to its essence as dwelling within it as a soul, for instance, is necessary in order to explain the individual thing for it's determined in all its aspects by other things outside it. And that's the reason um, that the only form that can apply directly to inorganic things is the external or intentional form. They don't have the, their concept as it were, actively animating their own uh, existence in the world. But he thinks that there are things that actually have their own concept actively animating their existence in the world. And those are organisms. Uh, and um, well, actually, I have another point to make here before that, namely that uh, Kant admits that in uh, organisms, or at least apparent organisms, since Kant can't actually believe that anything, or actually believe with objective certainty that anything is an organism, 
even himself. Um, in an apparent organism, the whole is there because of its parts and the parts are there because of the whole. But Kant believes that those two becauses are themselves actually different. That first because, because the whole is there because of its parts is objective and capable of clear uh, justification. I'm here because I have hands and a heart and knees and uh, things like that. And that's pretty objectively verifiable. You can dissect me and find those parts. But the second because is at best subjective, regulative and useful in spurring further scientific reason, uh, further scientific research. Uh, so when you claim that um, I am, uh, my, my parts are there because of the whole, that's a heuristic and not subject to validation in that same kind of objective, observable, empirical way. Uh, but as I've said, Hegel thinks both of those assertions are true uh, and both of the becauses are equally objective. There's no reason to give them different ranks. Um, though you may give them different explanations, there's no reason to think that they rank differently. Um, he connects the concepts of thing kinds and teleology and a threat to the objectivity of teleological explanation is therefore also a threat to the very objectivity of things. So that again, reinserts teleology at the very heart of our metaphysics or his metaphysics. Um, and so he goes on to apply this to uh, the whole world itself. Um, obviously the only design which could apply uh, to the whole world would be inner design because he rejects, as we've seen, this idea of an extra mundane God who treats the world as his own artifact, um, built like a cobbler builds a shoe. So he thinks that we have to understand the world whole on an analogy, at least with an organism. Uh, I don't think he would say that it is an organism, but it's like an organism in some important ways. Um, and of course, organisms do not perfectly exhibit the teleology of self-realization uh, because no finite object can achieve a perfect coincidence between its concept and its actuality between end and objectivity. Uh, no finite object is itself ever a fully realized end, but he does think the world whole is. Um, in order to argue for the need to consider the world whole teleology, Hegel argues that the teleology cannot be applied in a fully satisfactory way to anything less than the world whole. Well, you might argue, if we can't apply it satisfactorily or fully satisfactorily to anything less than the world whole, doesn't that sort of imply the teleology is really not quite legitimate? Why not infer the illegitimacy of teleological explanation? And I think the response there <clears throat> is that he thinks finite explanations are legitimate, but they're just not complete. And, you know, we do that all the time. Um, you know, most mechanical explanations of physical processes aren't going to be complete in the sense that they mention all the relevant, causally relevant factors. There's always a background of uh, factors that yeah, we know are relevant, but they're sort of, you know, they're, they're constant enough, they're reliable enough, we don't, we don't need to mention them. Most of our explanations um, really do turn out to be explanation sketches in many ways. Uh, and he thinks that's true when we apply teleological explanation to organisms. Yeah, they're not fully complete, but they do the job. They clarify things for us. They can organize the world in, in perfectly reasonable ways. <clears throat> So he thinks that there are things uh, to which mechanical, chemical, and teleological explanatory forms um, oh, that there are things right to which such explanatory forms apply is itself, he thinks, capable of teleological explanation. One of the reasons I think he favors teleological explanation is that he thinks that <clears throat> it can sort of come back on itself and, and give you a kind of explanatory closure that infinite strings of causal uh, mechanical events uh, really can't do 
Uh, similarly, even chemism won't, uh, as it were, be recursive enough to be able to uh, tie itself into a nice little knot. I think he does believe the teleology uh, can do that. Um, so a fully realized end can be nothing less than the entire system of subsidiary ends, means, and objects. And, and so that means the fully realized end is the world having realized itself, uh, having realized its own uh, concept. Um, and that's pretty much uh, how I read uh, Hegel. Um, I, I don't buy the stuff in the application of teleology to the world. I'm, that, that doesn't, hasn't convinced me, but I really think that he's got a, uh, an important and, and uh, in fact, a solid point um, with regard to the idea that making sense of that so-called uh, intentional model of teleology, which you can find, you know, distributed throughout the literature, uh, particularly, you know, the modern discussions, Larry Wright and uh, Andrew Wood, Woodfield, is it? Um, bunches of them have it. Um, I think he's right to say that ultimately that presupposes um, uh, a more natural kind of functional teleology that looks more Aristotelian, you know, whether it is Aristotelian is something I'll leave to Aristotle scholars, but uh, uh, I, think, I think that point is actually very soundly made uh, and something that uh, uh, was missing uh, in uh, uh, a lot of the discussion of teleology as it uh, occurred in the 20th century, at least. So that's where I am. <laughs>